welcome to Explore, Explain. This is a long-form video and podcast series sharing conversations with data visualisation designers and developers from around the world. Each episode explores the detailed hidden thinking behind a single project or a series of related works to explain the what, the why and the how of the design process. There are some wonderful guests and some wonderful projects to learn about. So let's jump in to today's episode with your host, Andy Kirk. Hello and welcome to Explore, Explain. In today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Tom Warville to the show. Tom, good to see you again, mate. Um, for the benefit of listeners and viewers, can you just give a brief introduction about who you are, where you work, and what you do, please? Sure thing, Andy. Um, yeah, I'm Tom Warville. Uh, I'm a football analytics writer at The Athletic. Um, and what I do, essentially, I write data-driven stories for The Athletic about football, um, focused on the Premier League, focused on teams and players across the world, um, based on recruitment, performance, all kind of areas of football, um, but primarily using data. Fantastic. Today, we're going to go into one of your pieces that you worked on with collaborators. It wasn't just yourself, but um, a project titled uh, Lionel Messi's 10 Stages of Greatness, which was published in August of this year. Now, at this point, I recognise that there's going to be half the people switch off because it's about football. <laughs> and then another little subset of that switch off because it's Messi and not Ronaldo. So to those people leaving us right now, sorry to see that you're going. For those who will stick around, um, for their benefit, again, can you just give a brief description about what this project is, what it looks like, what's in it? Yeah, so we kind of wanted to write like a definitive piece about Messi. So what it is, is a piece about his career from his debut at Barcelona up until 1819, which as we'll get into is kind of where we had the data up until. Um, and we wanted to go through like what what are the 10 aspects of his game that we think are most, uh, I guess, obvious or, or interesting. And when did he kind of peak each of those skills? So you've got kind of a bit of a, a bit of a biography on kind of when he made his debut and then all of these 10 skills. And then kind of from the data, when was he kind of best at them and then we've kind of defined best in, in maybe different ways in different categories um, and then kind of interwoven with that some graphics some chart showing actually you know that peak and then some pictures as well to show kind of the progression or, or what um, you know what he even looked like <laughs> throughout his career um, so hopefully it's like a, a quite nice long essay I guess but a, a bit of a feast of kind of um, interesting nuggets about Net Messi from a data perspective but also some good aspects about him as a, as a person and, uh, and as a player. That's right. And it's a really nice blended piece, which I think is characteristic of the athletic. Um, you've got the imagery, you've got the charts, you've got the data, and you've got the the written form. It's not just about throwing charts out at people. It's saying, here's analysis, here's written commentary. In the, in the context of the athletic, so just to give people a bit of background, first of all, perhaps what the athletic is, but then in the context of the the kind of the mechanisms of how content is produced at the athletic how does a piece like this get even started is it something that you pitch or is it pitched to you and in this case michael cox who was your sort of main sort of shared author yeah so i guess to answer the first bit the athletic is a um behind the paywall sports journalism website um covering I mean, it started initially covering American sports, but now has expanded in August last year to cover the Premier League, and we've got a couple of European football writers as well. Um, and this piece very much came actually from the editors wanting to just sort of say, look, we've got Michael Cox, who is a football tactic expert, for lack of a better uh, title. Um, got myself, who obviously is kind of the only real data data journalist, I guess, on staff. Um, and we've got a Spanish football expert in Dermot Corrigan. Um, so I think together they were like, right, there are the, the raw materials or ingredients here for a really nice piece. The definitive piece in our eyes, hopefully, about Messi. So mm. our editor kind of pitched it. Um, and then kind of it was on the three of us to, to me, myself, Michael and, and Dermot, to bring the expertise we have in our different domains and try and kind of work together to create initially the bare bones of what the final product of the piece was and then have our editor um, who's Charlie Scott who's, who's kind of my editor and um, great at his job and, and really good at kind of like bringing all that together and turning it into something that is um, a less rough around the edges I'd say and flows mm. nicely and looks good and essentially is the article that you see on the site right now. And uh, the context of August of this year um, I mean I, I guess you started well before then we'll come on to the timescales in a second why was a piece about Messi 
of the moment. I know that at the time, as a football follower myself, there was a bit of turbulence around his potential future at the club, which would be you know, sort of size making its impact. Mm. Was that in part a trigger for looking at this topic in itself? I mean, we very much started the messy piece, I think, at the start of May. Um, so from then up until actually releasing it, there was quite a long wait. And I remember kind of messaging Michael and, and Dermot and Charlie a few times, sort of saying, you know, when are we going, when are we going? Because I guess from a from a journalist's point of view, they don't want to put it out when Messi's not a story, right? Um, <laughs> Barca didn't do very well in the Champions League last year. They they didn't win the domestic league. So it was all about trying to find a nice time to, to hook the piece on the back of and kind of push it um, from that kind of perspective. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we were fortunate that Messi was a, a headline to some extent in the summer because of all that happened at the club. So that was, um, I guess, luck, really, that that happened. We were very much just pushing for, we have a piece ready, Messi will hopefully do something within the next few months and we can kind of tack on the back of that. Um, and, yeah, that, that was the main reason, really. And I suppose across all the different topics that the Athletic will cover, there's a blend of some that are kind of evergreen pieces that will be timed whenever perhaps there's a gap. Um, and then others that are just, you know, very much reporting on the current affairs of the of the sport. Now, with respect to the the work that you and Michael and, and Dermot pulled together, how did you work together? And I'm, you know, we're talking about pandemics, we're talking about lockdown, working from home largely. How did that kind of work out in terms of the actual process that you three went through to to collaborate on a piece? I mean, that's not necessarily as simple as you just going on your own to produce a piece yourself. Yeah, not at all. Uh, it was probably the biggest project I'd undertaken as well after joining in February. So it was very much kind of a, um, a first in terms of how are we actually going to you know divvy up this work and, and create the final product. Um, I mean, the truth is we just did a lot of discussion through Slack. We had a Slack mm. channel with the three of us, our editor, throwing ideas in. And, and initially it was how, like, which way are we going to go about it? Because I think Michael's initial thoughts were these what these are the kind of the stages of Messi's career and what he was good at at each stage. And I looked at it a different way, which I think is a far easier way from a data perspective, which was what are 10 skills we can measure with the data we have and when was he good at those 10 skills? Mm. And I think that lent itself far more from a kind of data perspective from a you know how do we actually mind what the stories are perspective um even though michael's potentially is the more i guess focusing it from that perspective and doing it in a kind of a chronological this is what he was best at throughout the years um may have better but it was just the, the fact that we needed to rely on the data to kind of make this the piece that it is and i think right. in the end we all agreed that was the the best angle that's interesting so that in a sense there were perhaps two gravitational forces there usefully mm. you know what's interesting about you know someone who's such a, a superstar footballer and then actually what have we got to evidence in terms of data and then how do those things collide because I can see how we you know with such a long career and he has you know his career has evolved from this prodigious talent to this prolific superstar to perhaps a, a more efficient player in his latter years but you know, three stages is not interesting. So I think it's it's interesting how you did divide that up. And we'll come on to the the ten topics um, in a, in a while. Mm. With regards to an, another aspect of people, which is the the readership. Um, obviously, the athletic subscribers is in itself a you know a subset of any reader that could ever read this piece in itself. But I wondered if within the work that you and Michael do. Is that a, a, another subset even further within the athletic subscriber group? And therefore, who are you thinking of when you're thinking of who's going to read and consume this work? Yeah, I, we definitely wanted to make it as accessible as possible. So we want people who are you know, casual football fans to be able to look at it and, and take something away and understand when Messi was best at, at different things. Um, and I think that you kind of see that in the way that we maybe try and... Um, it's presented like clicking on the article, getting to the article. There's not a lot of like mention of this is a data, you know, mm. really heavily data driven piece. I think that that sometimes when you signpost people and or a, an article and say this is stats heavy, you will naturally turn people off. Whereas you, you kind of want to sometimes like sneak it in and mm. get them to into the article and then realize this is a lot of you know there's a lot in here but hopefully by that point they're interested and they're reading it so um i think that yeah the focus very much was just make it first and foremost about messy and then just so happens that it's it's very data driven and, and actually yeah i mean 
when you look at the content, you've got quite a few photo images to begin with and mm. a fairly set up article before you even get into the, the, the data side. So I, uh, I can completely imagine that being sort of thought process there. Um, and of course, it's a long form piece. So there's an expectation there that any audience who's coming to this will be um, able to give and willing to give, you know, a bit of their time, a bit of their effort to, to process this. And again, I think that's, you know, from the outsider as a subscriber, that seems to be what The Athletic are, you know, in many ways about, you know, although it's a fast moving sport and a fast moving world of journalism, it's also within that there's room for slow journalism and sort of bigger pieces and, and long form pieces, which I guess newspapers don't necessarily give the, the room for um, anymore. Um, I'm also thinking, and I know that you're somebody who's really um, considerate and concerned with the ability of audiences to make sense of the analysis and the charts and the graphics that you that you put together and do you therefore are you therefore modifying your natural approach when you come to putting together the charts and the graphics that we see in this in terms of perhaps being reluctant to use slightly unfamiliar methods or do you know that because people will spend time with this it doesn't really matter if it looks complicated because they should be able to get through the the process of reading i feel it's probably a mix of the two i definitely and you can see from when we get into like the choice of charts there is a very much kind of a a visual vocabulary i try and kind of enforce upon the reader early doors where it's like right this is the chart that's going to show trends over time you're going to get familiar with this um, and hopefully make that as simple as possible to kind of read and understand and there's a few more i guess set piece graphics in there which allowed me to you know do something a little bit more creative um mm. which arguably are the, are the more illuminating um i mean again we can talk about those later but I, th I think it was a mix of the two of having something or a chart type which people have seen before and also um display the information in such a way that is easy to grasp and get straight away um mm. and then another which is something a bit different which makes them go wow i've not really seen this before or at least hopefully that's <laughs> that's the reaction that's right and it feels like there's a there's a blend again. We'll come to it later, but there's a blend between sort of setting the scene of when did this thing happen or when was this thing at its peak, and then let's explore that thing a little bit more deeply, which I think is a nice a nice sort of blended approach for different levels of graphical literacy out there. Um, so within a piece like this, uh, what's the process that you work towards internally uh, towards signing this off, completing it? you know when does it kind of get the thumbs up from the boss to say right that's it finished um i guess it very much has to go through the editing process which will be um i think that i'm not not an editor i don't have much of an insight into specifically what the editors are doing but i think it's very much kind of like does this does this piece kind of meet what we wanted to set out to do in the first place does it make sense does it flow right um and then the other the rest of the editing process is you know is it factually correct do the figures make sense are the graphics clear and obvious and, and the editors aren't you know they're they're as data literate hopefully as our readers are which means that they are questioning it and poking it and, and hoping that um, they are kind of the first, the first ones through the wall, I guess, with any graphics. So if they can understand it and uh, and be able to interpret it and get something from it, then we've yeah. we've done our job, hopefully. Um, see, so it's yeah. very much when you tick all those boxes, the stuff is finished and you're um, you're ready to to publish, really. Right. Yeah, the idea that somebody else sort of take on the the perspective of the audience, I think, is quite a good sort of first round of of testing something. Now, the athletic mm -hmm. exists. It's a digital um, platform. It's um, for mobile, for laptop, for um, for uh, tablet, I guess. Um, so that there isn't any printed output for this. And you know, when we look at the the overall structure of the piece, it's fairly it's a fairly standard architecture. It's a sort of vertical um, kind of linear story. Do you have to think about mobile to desktop? transferability adaptability or does it just come with the the kind of templates that the athletic publish with yeah so i think that with our graphics um we very much write and, uh, and edit kind of on, on desktop um so even though we have a high proportion of our audience uh, reading 
on mobile, um, they are probably more optimized for reading on the desktop. So I do think that's something that we want to focus on more in the future. Um, one thing I've kind of played around a bit with is um, if you have kind of a, a trend, instead of going from left to right on most kind of bar charts or line graphs, is there a way that you can have kind of up to down and have some sort of way that as you scroll down through the piece, you see the trend over time? Um, that is one that I don't think comes naturally to many people, especially mm -hmm. when you're so used to seeing graphics which go from you know left to right. If you look from left to right, bottom to top is is good. Um, so so changing that and kind of moving it around ninety degrees is quite a difficult thing to to get right in your head. But I do think that for us, creating some kind of mobile first templates would be. Um, something to, to kind of focus on in the next kind of few months just because you get so much more value from your readership who can read stuff natively instead of having to kind of like tap into it rotate their phone look at it there's like mm. levels of friction which take away from their experience that's right and i guess there's also something about the the social media ability of the the charts and graphics to be to be pasted into a into a tweet into a, mm. a facebook post into just add that extra little bit of teasiness uh, to it the the other thing about constraints, I mean, you talked about timescales, so it doesn't feel like it was a, a piece where you had to reach necessarily a certain deadline because the story was about to elapse in terms of um, importance or relevance. Mm -hmm. um, were there, however, any other pressures that you had to contend with or any other restrictions? I mean, I guess you're also working on many other things as well, so there's, a, I guess, a need for you to cook through it just to get focused onto, onto other things as well. Yeah, it's that balance, really. It's the, the juggling act of kind of being, um, you know, one of the very few people at The Athletic who, who I guess, the only person at The Athletic who is um, thought of as a data expert in football analytics. So I get, you know, hounded with questions, um, some simple, some complex, you know, a lot of the time and work on a lot of pieces with other writers. So it was definitely, a, you know, can you spin this one large plate that has a lot of value while well, spinning the other smaller plates um, alongside that? And to what extent do you have to bear in mind what others may be doing, as in other um, other media, other news organisations, other sports analysts out there? Do you, do you personally sort of take into mind, you know, others have done this, so I need to find a way to differentiate from what they've done, or others have done something similar about a different context, and I'd like to kind of emulate that kind of approach. Does that come into thinking? Yeah, it definitely did here. There was a piece by Benjamin Morris on 538 about Messi, um, it was years ago now, I think it might have been 2014, um, looking at essentially his career up to that point and some, some stats, mainly zooming in on him that season. So I think that for me was a nice template of like, <laughs> we're doing a big data piece on Messi and it's actually kind of done, been done before, albeit slightly differently and with a d different data set. Um, so that was definitely much one that we had in mind when doing this. Um, and then there are other data biographies which um, have, have gone down really well. I remember there was one from Dennis Rodman. Um, again, I think it might have been by, by Benjamin Morris, which is one of the very early sports analytics long-form pieces, um, which I kind of lent on in terms of, you know, if this is a... Um, you know, a Hall of Fame piece of sports analytics mm. writing. How do we, how do we, uh, you know, emulate that, and how do we mm. take what makes it so good and apply that to our own work? Interesting. Yeah, I think it's. I, I think there's sometimes a bit of a grey area with regards to people being inspired by other works, and there's sometimes a little bit of hesitancy mm. that they don't want to acknowledge that something inspired. In case there's a sense of, you know, I don't even plagiarism or copying, but yeah. um, why not? Why not build on what others have, have done successfully and, and be inspired by, by those things? You mentioned their data. I think we should move on to looking at the, the data itself. Um, I mean, there's, you know, if we look at photography as data, we'll, we'll touch on that in a second as, you know, the sort of origins of that um, bunch of assets. But the, the actual data that you use for your analysis, um, StatsBomb is referred to a lot. Can you just talk about where the data came from and why you knew that this was the, the good source to uh, to refer to. So we got the data from StatsBomb, which are a football analytics company. They're a football data company. Um, and they collect data from a bunch of leagues, competitions, both in the men's and women's game. Um, and they've released this messy data set, so going essentially all of his games that they could have access to video for from 2004-2005 till, well, to now, um, which is well, end of last season, 2019-2020. Um, for us, it was just the, the only real data source we could have access to because it, um, it was free, it's in the public domain. We got Statsman's blessing to use it for this piece. Um, and it's a very, very granular and useful data set. And I think that had we had 
more time for this piece we did a sequel there's there's still so much more you could dig into there so for us that that was a big reason as to why we could do this piece in the first place really yeah i seem to remember the uh the folks at step bomb you know actively put this out in public to kind of encourage people to to work with it, which i think is you know really refreshing you know it feels to me sometimes football data in particular can become quite secretive and quite proprietary but that's something to you know to quite refreshing to see something like that being put out in the domain. Um, would you have any observations about the data that you worked with? I mean, obviously, there's a, I guess there's a sense of assurance that there's a, you know, it's, it's good quality, accurate data set from, from those guys. Now, in terms of the, the shape and size and the kind of extent of it, did you, can you recall any particular challenges that you faced with the data about, you know, the huge numbers that were diverse or, difficult to fit all this data into one into one view i mean obviously it goes up to 1819 your analysis mm. um a, a further point would therefore be would you were you tempted to top that up to the end of 1920 which i think was relatively complete at that point in the calendar yeah um so i mean the stats from data is what in sports analytics we call event data so every single row relates to an event or a ball touch really that happens in a game of football um and i previously worked at opta who are a kind of a rival supplier and i've worked with data of that type many times before so the biggest challenge for me was trying to kind of get my head around this slightly different data spec um how it looked um and essentially yeah learn what this this data frame now look like versus one that I was so used to seeing um, kind of in my mind's eye when I think of using event data. So that, that was one one part of it. And that was quite a, a uh, it's a fun challenge, but also one where you're aided by quite well with the public tools that are available. There was a public um, stats bomb R package, which is really useful to do a lot of the basic data gathering work and also data cleaning. They have some functions in there, which mean you can pretty much within five ten minutes get all the data and, and you're set up ready to kind of analyze and go from there so that was really good um in terms of topping it up for 2019-20 um the data set is kind of since we published has been updated to include that season um, we tried to include stuff where relevant um but the kind of feeling was we checked on kind of various other sources to see if Messi's kind of stat in a given category had changed. And if it hadn't so much, I think we were kind of fine with if we're saying that, you know, 20, I think 2014-15 was his best year for scoring, we can stick with that in the confidence that he's not beaten it this year. So um, part of it was just a decision to get get everything finalised and get it ready instead of kind of dragging on what was a three-week, four-week, five-week project mm -hmm. um, before we, we were kind of finished really. And I guess that's just a natural consequence of the phenomenon on which you are analysing being incomplete. You know, he's mm. still playing. He's still at the top of his game. Um, so I guess in due course, there'll be a chance for you to revisit this, as, as you said, with a sequel and more of a career retrospective fully when it when it's fully finished. Mm. Um, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting for for listeners and, and viewers is to understand some of the tools and technologies that people use. So you mentioned the R package there. I mean, is R one of your natural habitats for doing this kind of work? Yeah, so for me, R is definitely the kind of software tool of, of choice just because it was the first programming, programming language that I learned. Um, and I, I was just kind of thinking in terms of kind of reproducibility and project workflow, I had in my head kind of a, a workflow I'd spec'd out where I'd have a folder for each piece that I contribute to an R project, a script folder, a data folder, a plots folder. And I think that that is, in my mind, the most clean way of doing it. And I didn't really have a good Python alternative that I could I could lean on. So I just mm. kind of made that choice early on in the days of The Athletic and it's kind of paid dividends because I'm not um, having to change workflow mid-piece or, or after a few months. So um, yeah, I, I started using that and just kind of stuck with it really. As you said, the, you know, the, one of the benefits, I'm, I'm not talented remotely in R, but I know that one of the benefits of it is the reproducibility. You know, once you've written a, a routine, you can recycle it and reuse it if you're using very, some very, very similarly shaped data for further inquiries. So, yeah, there's almost investment there to, to benefit later on. Um, we, we're about to sort of, sort of move into the discussion about the contents and just as a sort of bridge between those, the, the photographs that we see in this piece, 
you know, I, I I feel we should see these as another uh, another asset, another, another piece of data to enrich the story. You've said that it's a nice um, additional um, type of media to to blend the whole thing together. How do you go about finding and selecting the image? I mean, I guess is it fair to say the Athletic have access to a big photo library from which you can you can dive in and pick some? Yeah, that's we have a Getty subscription. I think I'm not sure that the level as to um, as to that, but um, yeah, we have you know Getty, and it's it's really useful to go in and pick out you know, photos that that match the the copy at times. And I do think there's sometimes like a bit of a a tongue in cheek element to the photos that are chosen. I mean, I wrote a piece not so long ago about the Premier League under the microscope. And my editor chose the picture of him and Son and he's kind of doing a celebration where he does a kind of magnifying glass. Oh, uh, nice, yeah. So there's some where they, <laughs> the editors who choose the photos can have some fun with it. But other times it's very much just a like, can we fit something that reflects what's being said in the copy really? And I think mm. that, I don't know if there's kind of training on that, but I feel they have a very good eye for it. And, and it, it, yeah, like you say, it's kind of another it's visual data but it really adds to the product at times and makes it look more complete and um polished that's it I, you know it adds that nice texture um to to see the things that we're we're reading about and looking at it through the charts um and that's what we move on to now so the the content in terms of the um the different sections and the different charts that you did work on for analysis um so i, I guess i mean we, we we won't spend too much on each of these individually but we talked earlier about how, in a sense, you've got this blend of let's position this um, this phenomena of his performances in the context of time and when he was at his best at this thing. Mm. And then there's something that's usually kind of a companion piece to, to probe deeper. I mean, did that kind of rhythm analytically emerge kind of quite soon in your sort of thought process about what analysis you were going to compile for this? Yeah, I think that because right at the start we decided on we're going to try and pick 10 parts of Messi's game and go from there. I think that from me, when I get in my our notebook, I know kind of how I'm going to lay this out. I know the way that I'm going to kind of attack this from a coding point of view. Um, and I think that, yeah, it was definitely really useful because I initially was thinking, right, if we're going to have a similar sort of chart for each section, we can build a template for that first and kind of lean on that from there. Um, so yeah, it was definitely useful to get that sorted out at the start and then that was very much a, a bit of an iteration process on can we this kind of chart selection which we use can we kind of nail this down and make this kind of signed off first because it's going to power a lot of um a lot of the points we're trying to make at times and you, you said there that the, the the sort of 10 came first and does it help to almost apply that arbitrary constraint to help sharpen your focus about sticking to you know the, the real most important metrics or measures of his performance and not end up with 20 30 40 different things yeah i i, I think so purely because it time boxes a little bit and it means that you can say right i know i've got to get these 10 things and dig into the data to create outputs on them and i know roughly how long that takes so we can we can start to you know plan for release we can start to plan when we can actually have deadlines for this um oh, right. I, and then the flip side also is the data is so vast, like there's every single touch of every player in every game that Messi's played back to 2004, 2005. There's so many dimensions you could cut there. I think that without that constraint, kind of like what you said, you are going to be sit there. And for me, I definitely think that I need those constraints in place because otherwise I will just wallow in, um, I don't know, struggling to find focus at times. Mm. And I think that that for me personally is really helpful to say, right, we're just going to have 10 things, uh, let's discuss them, here they are, then go and go and find them in the data. Right. So, yeah, so, so what you're saying is that, again, there was this sort of back and forth between perhaps yourself and Michael with saying, here are the things that I'm finding through the data. And I guess it's not just a, it's not just a random fishing exercise. You know the sport, you know what you're kind of, hypothesis will be about what you think he's played very good at yeah and then i guess you'll just sort of marry that up with what michael's prompts are saying to arrive at a, a rough outline would that be the, the general process that you might have gone through yeah i'd say so i think that a lot of the value that michael bought is contextualizing the data and, and me kind of saying look this is the trend on say dribbles he was trying most when he was younger and coxie knowing the role that messi played in that team at that time and kind of this encyclopedic knowledge of, of football and no, I guess not really a messy expert, but knows enough that we can 
we can make sense of what we're seeing in, in that data. Mm. Um, mm. So, yeah, I think that that was mainly the, the case. And that was really useful because there are times when we're looking at some really specific data, like I managed to code up kind of when Messi like did a, a one-two with a player. We can count that and who with and things like that. Um, and we could then link that straight away to him having a really good partnership with Danny Alves on the right-hand side. Yes. And then Michael's saying, you know, he's seen him in, in games or can, can kind of add context on, you know, certain moments where that's really been a problem for, for the opposition. So uh, if we just delve into the first one, which I think is a, a nice sort of quintessential uh, structure of all the all the 10 pieces. So this is when uh, Messi was at his peak as a dribbler. That's the question. When was that the case? So the first few is the line chart, um, which is just fairly, you know, a fairly routine method, of course. Yep. Um, and what we're seeing is the, the number of dribble attempts per ninety minutes in the uh, the league games across this time period. Um, and I guess probably what's something nice there for you as an analyst is, I mean, there's just a, a, an immediate peak. It's it's kind of clear through the data there, and it's also kind of kind of clear through the trend as well that it's it's sort of evolving over time. I mean. Did you ever consider other methods to show that thing, or was it always just going to be a line chart? I mean, perhaps, I don't know, like a bar chart would be an option, I guess, to show things over time, but was it always about this sort of continuity that was important? Yeah, I quite like the way with these these charts that you can kind of see the flow, you can see the trend straight away, and I, I just don't think it looks as nice with the, if you have like a bar chart and you're drawing the similar kind of line through it. Um, I think we could have maybe, you know, you could smooth out the trend and do like a, a Lois um, kind of line through it. Mm. Um, but I do think this was the best way and then having kind of a dotted trend line to, to kind of, yeah, this is the trend um, mm. kind of points that out a bit more. So yeah, I think that that for me was always going to be the way that we we kind of attack this. And I think although, you know, these pieces aren't shown simultaneously, I think there's something about the trend line in this case, kind of going down, mm. which you can then juxtapose with something else later on that goes up to show mm. that it's not him just getting worse at something. It's that his game's evolving, which I guess is part of the, the story here. Um, the, the next piece that we see is um, kind of a sort of small multiples contour map, or I think technically for the shouty cartographers out there, uh, isopleth map is the technical term. Um, so we've got, for most people, we might call these a little heat map, but this is where on the pitch Messi's dribbles sort of took place. I mean, this is kind of fascinating data. I mean, from the geographic point of view, um, is it just literally where he is physically on the pitch whenever he is dribbling? Yeah, so the dribble in kind of stats, woman, I guess wider football data terms, is trying to beat another player by running past them, knocking the ball past them you know, relating past them. However you want to do it, you've got to get past another player. So this is very much the X, Y coordinates of where that, that took place. Um, and I think that, yeah, I just thought that sometimes in a season where a player has lots of dribbles, you just, if you plot dots, you just get a, a buildup of dots. You can adjust the alpha and kind of show, look, there's some sort of, you know, you start to see a bit of like heat in an mm. area. It's like, okay, well, a heat map is just the natural way of, of showing um, a data set, a volume of something yeah, in this in this way, at least for me. And was on it. I mean, obviously, this is uh, about the where in contrast to the when. Mm. Was there anything about this particular chart that I don't know surprised you, or did you expect to see the the patterns that we see again? Where you know, for non football listeners, watchers, I guess he largely started a fair bit of his career on the right hand side in the forward line and it moved more into the centre perhaps a little bit deeper but this seems to bring it out for me but was there anything on there that sort of surprised you as a as an analyst rather than as a, as a football follower yeah I think it was to, part of it is mainly just the banding and the kind of like the the area of which Messi's dribbles cover the pitch and I think to some extent that is because of even though he plays right wing in one game it might be that he plays left wing in another and it's kind of you know it skews the data slightly mm. And I think that's kind of a, a tough thing where, let's say we want to just do all of his games at right wing, um, you, you'll lose a large amount of data where he's actually not played right wing for a season, he's played at striker. So um, the, for me, it was just interesting to see the vary of, variance in kind of like positioning across the pitch where these dribbles took place. I think the more interesting thing from a technical point of view was how to balance out on these graphs kind of how the heat element of the heat map works so mm. do you do kind of like this is the the maximum within this season or do you do kind of this is a maximum across all of 
the seasons right. and show it that way, which is a very specific technical thing, but it can completely change the story of yeah. those maps. So what is it that we do see then? Is it within season, the highest and lowest? Uh, yeah, I think it's yeah right within season. So um, yeah, it is that the the most yellow point is within that season. So it might be that he might have done a low number of dribbles in comparison there one season versus another. But that's I guess not really what we what we care about here um, as much. And and you've already you've already established that shift in absolute numbers from the previous chat anyway. So in yeah. a sense, it could be a doubling up kind of redundancy in, in some respects. Um, the, the next chart we see is, is, you know, what's the consequence of these dribbles? Does it actually end up resulting in a, an assist or a or a goal? And again, I think, well, it seems to me that this is just a, a natural extension of, of this particular piece of analysis. And just sort of taking a step back, it, it feels like there is some deliberacy in the dribbling being the first thing that we look at. Now, is that is that the case? Is it because that's the kind of quintessential skill set that we think of when we think of Messi. Is it the first thing that he peaked at compared to other things? What was the reason for this topic in general being first? Yeah, I don't remember too well like how we specifically ordered the things. I, I get the feeling to some extent it was kind of a, just did it feel right? Um, mm. And with Messi, one of the most identifiable skills with him is that low centre of gravity, the way that he can shift his body in the ball so quickly. And I just think it made most sense to start with something that captures the reader's attention because hopefully when they think of Messi, they think of dribbling. And then once yeah. they're in on that, they're hopefully a, a bit hooked and, and will you know continue to, to read it. That's right. And then we move on to look at uh, almost like a diagrammatic portrayal of a famous dribble that led to a goal. Hmm. Um, now, later on, we get slightly more um, sort of video still frame by frame uh, views of these moments. This is more of a helicopter view with kind of old school sort of drawings and diagrams of the sequence. Why did you land on that treatment for this particular con content item? I think it's just being able to overlay multiple examples at once. I don't think it's possible with with doing stills and photos and at least like the way that we can carousel graphics on the site, I think doesn't lend itself too well on mobile. And maybe that, you know, if you have a, you know, imagine like an image carousel where you can say, here's the first dribble, swipe right, you see the second, swipe right, you see the third. I think maybe that could have worked. But here I just yeah. thought there's data points as well we want to show. So on the graphic, we are talking around the speed of which or the duration of which he's on the ball to create a chance to score a goal. Um, so there's an example of against Zaragoza. Um, he has 1.6 seconds on the ball, beats a man and slots it bottom corner and I think that that's a nice thing to be able to show um, yeah. you're not going to be able to get the rights to show video we can't show GIFs so let's try something slightly different and, and achieve the best of, of both worlds mm, Absolutely right um, and, and obviously we've, we've kind of set up the helicopter vantage point from the previous small multiples map view so it's, it is a, sort of an extension of that kind of commentary uh, perspective at least mm. um, As we move through the, the other section I've got to go through this quite quickly. Um, so we move on to looking at when he was peak as a right winger, as a false nine, as a goal scorer, as an assister. Which of these other topics did you feel, I don't know, revealed something especially interesting from your point of view again as a as an analyst? Do you feel that there was something that, I don't know, surprised you or nicely supported a, a preconception of, I wonder if this is a thing, ah, it is a thing. Mm. I think it was the goal scoring. I think that right. Messi's numbers as a goal scorer, and this kind of answers a question which I guess we'll get into a bit in terms of like comparing him against other players. His numbers are so freakishly good that I think that um, it, sometimes it's kind of unfathomable that he can score at the rate that he does. And I think for me, I've not watched enough Messi or I haven't up to this point. And I think it, it kind of shook me a bit in the way that I was thinking there's probably not many years left of him at this level, we won't probably have a talent mm. like this ever again. And I, it just kind of really put into perspective just how good he is. Um, right. So for me, that was, you know, kind of a nice moment of, um, you know, me being the reader and getting the reaction that I hope some readers got for like, wow, he is actually, <laughs> he's this incredible, um, really. And it's, it's a nice moment that I can't remember. Who, there was a quote from someone in the debt of his field once who, who sort of said, you've, you've reached this level of, 
um, immersion in your data, when you start to be surprised or you start to feel this sort of glow of warmth of a discovery. And I think that's kind of, that's kind of captured that. And I mean, I really like the, as well, I think this kind of, again, reveals this phenomenon of his goal scoring feats, which is this um, connection map of the, the different places, positions, techniques, methods with which he scores a goal. It's not just he scores 60 or 70 from the six yard box. It's such a varied, rich array of different dimensions. Um, yeah, and I guess, guess if I, I was going to say, if I can speak on that one, for me, that that one was one where I've not really seen a ton of different ways where people visualize like different finishing types. And um, I just thought it was it was really interesting to see the variety of finishes. And when a lot of the times in, and this is very specific, but talking about way that players score goals in in football analytics terms, it's you know he gets this xG and and he's above or below, or he's he has mm. this many shots. And there's not a lot of like identifying different finishes and just showing them and showing that yes, mm. this player has a variety of like ways that he can score in his in his locker. Um, and it's one I've seen kind of replicated a couple of times which in the piece, which is obviously always a, a great thing to see that other people see the idea and they're like, oh, this is neat. Let's do this for, for Nicola Pepe at Arsenal, which is someone, yeah. uh, a guy called John Ollington kind of wrote a, a similar piece to Messi, but was doing it about about Arsenal and picked out that Pepe at Lille um, had this you know variety of finishes. So that for me was a really fun one where I created something I probably hadn't seen before. And that was, again, like you say, it's that that glow, that warmth that you've um, mm. you've done something that you find really interesting and um, kind of brought it to life. That's right. And would you, again, did you consider any other methods for that? I'm just thinking, I guess the classic, I'm thinking like the the classic display of the penalty uh, kick about to take place. You've got the different outcomes of previous shots. Mm. Were you ever thinking about the sort of, you know, the sort of the goal layout and then just put the balls in the net? Were, were there any other thoughts about how you might show that? Yeah, I always find those placement maps like are very much. They're probably quite reliant on where the shots are from. Um, mm. So I mean, a way that I would like to tackle this, if you to take it to a next level, is to kind of take it three D or kind of isometric and show show the shots where they're from. If they're all kind of like the player's done, Messi's done a dribble down the right and then cut in, and then looking at like has he gone for the same position in the goal each time, and and kind of encode that next level of data which is the third dimension into into mm. those plots i think that would be um an, another way of doing it but um i think probably lends itself a bit nicer to something interactive where you could click and drag your way around or you know isolate different types um which is kind of the limit of of my skills at the moment and actually we'll, we'll come on to interactivity in this in a second um or perhaps more commentary on, on the the absence of it um mm. in this case but on that note of sort of isometric displays and another um, view later later on in the piece is kind of annotated arrows onto stills of a, a video frame, which does bring the sort of three D perspective to life and lets you see a, a moment build up. I just wondered again. This is this feels like it's very much part of the part of the landscape now in, in football, both from the point of view of the broadcasters, uh, how they analyse matches both live and after the event. But also having been, you know, seen the kind of inside workings of a football club myself, it's it's also how they talk about it internally. And I, I just wonder if it's perhaps a more broader point about football analytics in general. Do you feel there's there's now just a, a slight, almost like a shared language between us as punters, you as analysts, and those who actually work and play in the sport? Yeah, I, d- I do, especially with this, you know, the whole kind of line drawing X and O's world that is, is so I guess was so foreign in football until maybe you know mm. 10 or so years ago and it's it's something that you probably see far more in American football and um, the kind of John Madden school of annotating the screen before the play actually happens um, but yeah I think it's interesting I, I do think or do wonder like where that's come from has it come from the explosion in popularity of Monday Night Football um, from you know people like Michael Cox or Jonathan Wilson kind of coming to the front of of football writing and providing a different angle so yeah I think that it's nice to know that now football media is thinking about the game in a similar way that those in clubs and those who are you know quote unquote professionals are thinking about it and I think that that brings the fans closer and that at the end of the day is, is what any fan wants they want to get inside the head of the coach and, th- and be able to think along the same lines 100% yeah I, th- I think that absolutely is it does feel like you're getting you know the, I mean the level of 
uh, analysis and writing on the sport right now is you know it's never been richer. Um, mm. But I think that also matches the the appetite that's out there, the hunger out there from readers to to see this stuff. We want to sort of know about these secrets, and I think it's you know an increasing sophistication of data in the sport as well. You know, ten years ago we were maybe looking at shots on target, possession, mm. and it's now much more intricate. And, and I guess there'll be. You know, I mean, I've seen it for myself, but there'll be a point at which it goes too far, and you try yeah. to over formulate, formulate football in a, in, into a spreadsheet when you lose that sort of human touch and that that kind of chaotic nature of the sport. But I think it does reflect the maturity overall. Um, again, not going through too much of the other um, topics in detail because there's you know there's replication of the same methods, which I think is is important for the reader, so there's not too much learning at each stage of a new new method, but uh, just two quick questions, really. Were there any other charts that you considered using and got close to, but didn't in any of the sections? And I think there are a couple of sections where there are no charts, no kind of tables of, of data. Um, I guess, why is that the case? And how did, therefore, those two things manage to get into the top 10, given that you were so data-driven in this case? Yeah, I think... On the first one, there were other kind of small multiples that we we looked at or attempted to use, and I think were thought overall they didn't add much to the piece or were maybe a bit too busy um, to include in there. And then on the second, I guess uh, there was very much in that overall list. You know, there are elements of we can pick up measurable skills, but we can also pick up you know when Messi was good in a certain position. Um, and I think it was just a balance of not enough time to maybe contribute data in that section because I think if we we could have looked more deeply and gone okay when he was a false nine and get you know, mm. go in the data and identify games as a false nine and look at goals xg shots whatever you want in those games and see was he you know was he best at those times um, and I think yeah to some extent we we didn't want to go fully data and turn off a, a large portion of readership who aren't to you know they can stomach it or like it but mm. they they aren't here for a kind of you know one hour read which is very very data heavy um yeah. and i think that in terms of the sections that didn't have charts maybe they didn't lend themselves to it or um it was just to to kind of give the piece a bit of flow so that it wasn't too mm. chart heavy which i think at times things can be um so yeah, that was it was just a bit of a balance really, and I think that given the platform and given it was a collaboration, I think balance was important for us for us to have. Yeah, and I think it's important as well to recognise that we don't always need a chart. You know, sometimes you can just say it, you can write it, or you can put it in, into just numeric form. So unless the chart reveals or exposes patterns that are otherwise invisible, then you know you don't need it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just re with regards to the sort of framing, so the way I describe framing is what's the inclusion criteria or the exclusion criteria. Um, I mean, we've talked about the, the, the season parameters, but th there's two aspects of this which I think are interesting in that it's primarily, although I know that you do mention at times Argentina, it is primarily his career at Barcelona. And again, was that was that conscious? Were you tempted to bring in some some numbers to sort of add the kind of international performances? Yeah, I think it skews it a little bit. Um, and given Messi's kind of been a one club player, um, and uh, you know we only had access to um, from Southampton for Messi from Barcelona, I think we could have maybe supplemented right. that data from other su suppliers. But then you have issues of kind of different definitions. You know, trends maybe don't match up because you're measuring slightly different things because of that. Um, so yeah, in the end, I think it was just far easier and cleaner to just look at um, the Barcelona years really. And I guess that, in a sense, answers my next question, which is, were you tempted to compare him with others? So not just, you know, the inevitable comparison with Cristiano Ronaldo, but, yeah. you know, others who have been exceptional dribblers or others who have been fantastic false nines. Was that ever in the thinking of, because it was a messy data set, did you just feel that just gives us our, our scope? Yeah, good use of messy data set there. Um, yeah, I very much think that... Um we would have liked to like I'd have loved to have done a comparison of Ronaldinho's dribbling ability versus Messi's or something like that um, the issue was we kind of had this this left join of just Messi's games so if Ronaldinho mm. happened to be in a Messi game that's great we didn't have games where he was present and played really well but because Messi didn't play he's not in the sample and it's the same with kind of Ronaldo I think we, we had around 30 games that might that's kind of a figure plucked out of the air but say 30 games of Ronaldo when he played against Messi and I don't think it's a large enough or reflective sample to 
compare those players in because if Ronaldo's playing Barcelona, that's a tough game for Real Madrid and it's mm. not reflective on the fact that Messi True. can go and play go and play teams who are you know of different quality and Ronaldo couldn't. So it it was a sample bias really that meant we didn't do that and I think that in an ideal world you you definitely look to compare Messi against you know mm. Samuel Leto, Ronaldinho, Thierry Henry, etc. etc. Cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and it certainly feels like it's a uh... I don't know, one for the future, you know, to look at Ronaldo individually and and to then look at these players in different uh, kind of comparisons. Um, we talked about, or we briefly talked about interactivity and the lack of, thereof. W- were you tempted to incorporate interactive features or did you feel that this needed to be, we're going to tell you something, just mm-hmm. sit back and read. We're not going to get you to be participant, just listen and read. Yeah, I feel to some extent... Um, I guess I'm limited technical skills wise of mm-hmm. having okay ability to do interactive stuff but not really trialed it out on the site um, so it probably would have taken longer to deliver the final thing if we were trying to do it as an interactive um, and then on the flip side it's like does or you know do we have the capacity to build out an interactive and, and can it actually work well from a user experience point of view like to, does the app allow or the the way that the app is engineered allow people to actually use whatever interactives we build so right. i just think that that was out of scope to begin with just because um of the the various difficulties in place to actually have an interactive really and static for me is kind of bread and butter at this point so it's very much if we want to deliver this piece within the next you know three to six weeks this is the the track that we'll go mm-hmm. down and i think you know from your perspective as a journalist i think it's uh you know that constraint, whether it's the skill side or whether it's the platform side, uh, you know, can be useful because it mm. means that you've just got to sort of take the lead and, and tell people stuff. So, uh, I mean, I, I face that myself with the limited skills that I have for interactive development. So, uh, that's my excuse anyway. <laughs> um, just going through some of the other design features before we wrap up, um, the annotation. I mean, the, the biggest annotation, I guess, is is the is the copy, is the is the article. Is that something that you? contributed towards did you do writing as well as michael or did you again sort of divide things up so that maybe he did that you did the charts and then you sort of cross-referenced each other yeah the the process was pretty much kind of have the sections in a google doc and add when ready really and then right. kind of go back and and i guess apply a second layer and, and and add additional information or commentary around the sections so it was very much a kind of for me at least both creating all the charts and then either writing about the charts, writing a bit more background or context, and then Michael kind of chipping in and, and adding where useful as well. So, um, yeah, very much a, a collaboration and iterative process to to kind of pull it all together, really. And I guess, I mean, we talked about the, you know, the lockdown pandemic before, but it kind of strikes me that you'd probably still do that process anyway, even if it was normal times. You'd still be kind of working in a collaborative Google Doc type interface and you wouldn't need to be sat next to each other, perhaps just for a an initial meeting maybe, but it's mm-hmm. something that does allow you to the, do that sort of dynamic development. The, I mean, the other annotations would be the kind of classic apparatus of titles and headings and, and um, grid lines and, and sort of labels. And, you know, I, I suppose one's always trying to find a balance between not putting too much clutter on a chart whilst also trying to be uh, sufficiently explanatory to the audience. Did you, I mean, it, it have you developed perhaps like maybe not a house style but your own style for what you find is the sweet spot for that yeah i think that it took a few months but definitely like realizing that grid lines i mean i feel they're pretty useful and having passed the like you know the dad test of does my dad understand what this this means do my housemate or girlfriend understand what this means like i think that, that those definitely were ones that stuck and then in terms of like axis lines i realized were kind of redundant as were access ticks and i think over time my i guess base theme my base athletic theme that i have has slowly changed where i've gone in and, and tweaked the mm. the mechanics under the hood and got to the place now where I'm, I'm pretty happy with it and i think that hopefully it's one that is a good balance of it's not too heavy with features like you say but also is is clean um and is also in line with our brand guidelines it's the right colors right. it's the right fonts it's all that kind of stuff which yeah um is i think it's a fun challenge i think some people if you start a fresh somewhere and you get given a you know a hundred paid guidebook on what the style should be like it's a bit daunting but um i definitely enjoyed the the iterative process of mm. um, of building that out and you talked about color and obviously we've got this um you know, we've got the colours of Barcelona, which seem to be 
uh, a conscious choice. So again, was that something that you set out with as an intention for the kind of Catalonian blue, yellow, sort of purple colours? Or is that just something that you felt in the absence of needing to pick any other colours, I might as well just sort of apply that sense of, you know, slight decoration to it? Yeah, I think it's one I probably fell into more. It's probably trialed it and then stuck with it because it, it I think it looks quite neat against the, the black background, the mm. contrast between the red of the points that we have and the yellow, which is are both kind of official Barcelona colours, works quite nicely. Um, the one thing I would like to point out is the kind of, and this was me kind of playing it around, but I used a, um, I can't remember the name of the package now, but it's uh, a way of kind of highlighting a specific point and providing a glow behind it. Um, oh, okay. And you see that usually on the on the point that's highlighted, there's like a small white glow behind it. Um, and that's something that I'd seen from Kirk, Book, Kirk Goldsbury, sorry, who is the kind of ESPN basketball analytics writer. And I've wanted to find a way to do it for a long time because Kirk's, the way he does kind of his charts sometimes they're really aesthetically pleasing and, and sometimes like the points he wants to highlight have shadows behind them and i just thought it's such an obvious and neat trick to do but never mm. really worked out like a nice way of doing it anyway i found a, a package which kind of can help provide glow behind points and that for me was oh, one okay. that um i've tried to use in other pieces as well and, and kind of highlight the player that or the the point which is of interest well i was going to ask about that because i wondered if you did any uh, sort of finessing in Illustrator, for example, or was it all produced within our, so all the design flourishes like that that we see, they're all contained within that within R itself? Yeah, all, all in R. I try and do that as much as possible just to speed up development of, of, of mm. charts. Um, there are a couple where there might be kind of quite obvious kind of drawn lines or circ- you know circles or things like that. Um, they're usually done in Preview or Mac um, just because it's the what I found is quicker to boot up, do it and save it and close it than anything else I've used. Um, <laughs> so out of pure laziness or efficiency finding, whatever way you want to put it, um, that was the, the kind of tool of choice there. And as we just sort of kind of bring things to a conclusion, kind of reflections, um, uh, I'm interested, do you have any, I don't know, any anal- analytics on how far people get in terms of reading the pieces, are you able to kind of get different bookmark points to say X percent of readers reach to the the kind of final chart? Do you get that sense of, you know, how it's gone down with people? Yeah, there there's some analytics we have. I'm not sure I can disclose kind of the granularity no, of, of which, but um, yeah, there's definitely stuff on kind of, you know, number of reads for a start, how many times do people get to the end of a piece. I think they're fairly standard across mm. industry. Um, something which I would like to have, and I think that it's potentially possible to get would be kind of how many times have people clicked on a chart to enlarge or how have they spent a long time looking at a chart? Um, and I think that stems of wanting to have a more empirical way of understanding do we need to make charts that are better optimized for mobile because that's where most of our our audience kind of lies Mm. um so yeah there's the there's there's charts that we have and we kind of access have access sorry metrics we have access to and and kind of you know will dictate sometimes the way that pieces are are written um which for me is interesting because this is a first job in in journalism but also b this is very much i think at the forefront of the way that um sports journalism is, is right now i can't imagine 10 years ago if you're writing for you know wherever the guardian you're not getting metrics feedback <laughs> on your pieces um so for someone who's obviously quite analytical at heart given we're talking about this subject that is uh, a, a quite a neat thing to understand and, and have a, a good feedback loop really mm, of course and you know you, i'm sure you've got the appetite to learn for yourself which charts are going down well which methods are connecting with people which ones maybe are are still perhaps a bit abstract, which may in due course become something that we are very familiar with, but for now it's maybe just not universal. I mean, I, I guess the other aspect of feedback is always the, the comments. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, even in a, in a, in a, in a site that's for members only in, in a sense, you do get some crazies in there. I mean, I was looking, browsing through, and by the way, most are absolutely hugely complimentary in fact it's it's actually quite a nice space is the comment section on the athletic mm. but there are there are always the ones who go <laughs> great article but yeah and then uh, here's some kind of comment about ronaldo um there's then the kind of counter argument which is no stats by metric on bottling men- mentality shame so there's kind of some funny stuff there very satisfying read and if i may help it perfect 
Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, he's a really good player, which kind of downplays things. But um, how how much do you you know how much do you place on sort of feedback like that and or through social media? You know, when you're kind of launching this sort of work. Yeah, I find the comment section actually really useful to to gauge feedback. There's a I guess a bit of ego massaging as well that takes place, which is probably <laughs> not wholly productive. Um, but it definitely wasn't something that as I came to join the athletic, I was like used to doing or, you know, you're always kind of, I think taught as soon as you're on the internet from a given age, like the comment sections are always quite dark and, and awful places. Um, but I'd agree the athletics comment section is usually pretty friendly. There's good debate on, on pieces. And mm. I think that the readership is at a point when they're providing, if it's, if it's, I don't know, it's not exactly aggressive, but if they disagree with the point, it's usually brought about in a way which is kind or at least respectful that this is someone's yeah. piece of work. They've not just like woken up and stuck it on the site, like effort has mm. gone into this. Um, and I think that I do generate and harvest a ton of ideas from the comment section. Um, and you do get some people who definitely like think about the game extremely analytically. Um, and that is is interesting because you're having conversations with like-minded people really so um yeah i i really enjoy interacting with with our writers on there so it's good fun yeah i think that's right and you know we the whole point of all this endeavor of anything to do with visuals or an article is to help people understand things and i think the the best pieces for me and it goes back to your the point you made before about that sort of warmth of seeing something yourself is Hmm. you know if if you are med if you feel smarter as a consequence of reading something, then you know what. What else can you expect of something? Or if it's even if it's just reinforced something that you suspected, you know we yeah. might suspect he's a brilliant player. This maybe reinforces it or reveals something new. So I think it's uh, it's nice that that kind of community of feedback and critical critical friends does exist, even if it's beyond the the staff who are already giving you that uh, already anyway. Um, Tom, that's been fun, fascinating. Thank you ever so much for going through the you know the the, the details of what's been a, a a hugely detailed piece and hard work I'm, I'm absolutely sure uh, thank you for, for your time today so much appreciated thank you to everyone who was listening watching out there and um, we'll see you again soon on another episode of Explore Explain thank you to see more information about today's episode including some links to key sites and resources mentioned please visit my website at visualisingdata.com here you'll also be able to find details about my book information about my public and private training courses as well as over a decade of blog posts. If you've enjoyed this series, please consider liking, subscribing and spreading the word. See you next time.